Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with uh, Tim Miller. Uh, Tim, how do, you, um, how do you describe yourself? Can you give a little bit of your background for the audience? How do I describe myself? I'm a man of many hats. I'm a, I'm a gay Oakland father. Um, I'm a former Republican operative turned writer slash maybe content man. I've got a, I write for The Bulwark. Uh, I have a show on Snapchat uh, for the teens. Uh, oh, wow. I'm on MSNBC from time to time. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a radical centrist. How, how is that? I'm an LSU Tigers fan. Now that's 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 plenty. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've I've known about you for for a while. Um, I remember the thing I saw about. Uh, I think the, I think it might have been the first thing or the first time you got my radar when you confronted Trump personally. You were like yelling at him for something. I remember this, and I you know I've come across your stuff every now and then. Um, but then I uh, you know the, the what immediately asking about his Chinese made ties. I was I was asking about it. I was asking if I could look at his tie <laughs> to see if it was an American made, if it was MAGA. Were you, were you like you were working for Jeb at the time? Was that what no, I was uh, I was working for an anti-Trump pack. It was after Jeb had lost, and I got signed on to be like basically an anybody but Trump pack. Like we were helping Kasich in Ohio and Cruz in Texas and Rubio in Florida, and just like to see if anything could stick. And um, and that was in a debate spin. Was, was that the best strategy to help one in each state? That seems like that might. Well, not no, have been. I mean mostly it was Cruz, honestly. Um, but we were trying at that point. We were trying to keep his. Um, delegate total under 50, right? So it was like, so Kasich, who pro- probably would have been better if Kasich dropped out, frankly, but he, he did, and I didn't have any control over that. I was in a super pack. So the, if, if Kasich was going to be stubborn and stay in, the best thing he could do was win Ohio, which he ended up doing, to kind of keep Trump's number low. The problem is that Cruz, you know, we need Cruz to do better in more of the competitive states. Um, and, you know, the idea was maybe if Kasich could win some and Rubio could win a couple of the of, of moderate states, then Cruz could kind of win the preponderance. Um, but uh, but that didn't that didn't happen. Uh, Indiana was ended up ended up being where it where it kind of the hope hope died. Yeah. Yeah. I, re- I remember this well. And so I remember around 2016, the, um, uh, you know, when Cruz right when he won to Iowa or maybe a little after that. Or maybe even a little before that, there was a, like an article um, in maybe the New York Times where Boehner and some of these other Republican bigwigs were like, "Hey, maybe Cruz is, you know, maybe Trump is, maybe Cruz is worse than Trump." And yeah. so it was, it was really, it was really funny because I don't think they would have, you know, I don't think they would have stuck to that position, you know, <laughs> access Hollywood and all that other stuff uh, happened. But it's, it did seem like if they had gotten behind Cruz, it could have been, it could have, it could have potentially because Cruz had appeal. Cruz could go and win Iowa, right? Jeb couldn't, uh, Kasich couldn't. Like he had a, he had you know some connection to the base that the other guys didn't have. Were they were they just stubborn, or were they just not seeing sort of the unique badness of Trump uh, to not to not get? Yeah, behind I mean Cruz a there? little bit of all. So Cruz, as look, Cruz isn't wasn't my cup of tea. Okay, it wasn't wouldn't have been my perfect candidate, but I, I just saw Trump as an existential threat, and and Cruz is kind of like normal bad on a few various things that we disagree on. Um, and I think that the problem is that Cruz. Was was very. Um, he's not very likable. <laughs> he's not not even likable enough. Um, and so I think his fellow people in the Senate and Congress didn't didn't like him. And so I think that that personal animus played a role. Part of it was stubbornness. Um, you know, part of it was ambition. Right. Like by the time we were kind of recruiting people to try to stop Trump, and you're presenting Cruz as the alternative, a lot of them were looking at it and saying. Eh, Cruz doesn't seem that much better to me, and I can get in early with Trump and shape him and and you know mold him. Um, whereas Cruz already had his own team, so I, I think that there are individual rationales. But um, yeah, I don't. I mean, look, I was one of the people that was trying to recruit those folks. So we were going state by state, and I would be calling. You know, you're, I didn't call Boehner. I didn't have a relationship with them. But, you know, like I worked for Huntsman, for example. So I'd call Huntsman in Utah. we come to Utah and I'd be like, hey, could, could you endorse Cruz? Or, or, you know, we did Wisconsin where we did well. You know, we got Charlie Sykes, who I'm with at Bulwark now. And then, uh, you know, Reed Ribble and some of the other conservative congressmen. Um, and we, but I, what I was, I, I just kept being astonished at how many of these people just basically were like, eh. Tim, I'm sorry. I'm not willing to put my name out there on this. I'm not willing to take sides. I don't know how much better Cruz is. If I do put my name out there, Trump's going to give me a nickname and MAGA people are going to yell <laughs> at me. And, right? Like all of that, all of that stuff played into it, right? Like ambition, fear of Trump, dislike of Cruz. And it just ended up that, that, that there couldn't, there, we couldn't rally around anyone. I, I say all of this, this is all a little bit inside baseball. At the biggest possible picture, the voters wanted Trump. 
And I think that kind of no matter what had happened, Trump was going to win one on one. I think that there are a couple of things. Maybe they're counterfactuals. Life is contingent. Maybe something could have happened that could have changed the trajectory. But but basically, Trump had like a 40, 45 percent hold on the on the party. And and it, and that's enough to win a to win a competitive primary. Um, so uh, all of this kind of strategic maneuvering was a little bit on the margins, but it still was annoying that that folks weren't willing to to join me um, in that effort to stop him. Yeah. Before we before we got sidetracked, I was going to say that our book is uh yeah your book uh, that motivated this conversation was uh, why we did it a travelogue from the Republican Road to Hell. Is this this is your first book? It is my first book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was, so- well, I was yeah, I was going to compliment you on it. I mean, it's very. I almost li- like your writing. I mean, and it's uh, it's you know, it's self reflective. Um, do you feel? Do you feel that you know? Is this is this like is this trait? This sort of being willing to be self reflective like this. I don't find it in a lot of other people writing about politics. Do you think you're unique in this respect? Um. I don't know if I'm unique as a human. I think I'm a unique as a person willing to talk about it in part because of circumstance, right? Uh, you know, people, uh, there's a lot of benefit in being reflective, really, particularly if you want to get another job, you know, in politics, right? Like it's much easier to go along to get along. Um, t- discussing your flaws and failures um, is like is a good way to, to be seen toxic as toxic. I, I had the benefit of the fact that like, I don't really want to work for Republicans again, nor do I think that they would hire me. And I don't think that Democrats are really going to hire me either. So I don't I don't aspire to be White House press secretary for Kamala in 2028 or anything. So I, I, I have the freedom to be self-reflective. Um, but I also think that like in the nature of it, which I talk about in the book, is that the kinds of people that are drawn to politics, professional politics, which is really who the book is about. It's not really about like activists. Um you know, I I, th- I do think that by nature they're more ambitious, uh, more willing to kind of put their moral and ethical judgments in a box, less interested in being reflective. Um, maybe it's less about their nature as, as well, and more about the culture, right? Like the culture of politics, which I write about a lot, is which is to say, hey. You know, like this is all part of a big game. Like we're playing this game, we're puppet masters in a game, and and to like reflect on, oh, what are the downstream effects of every little tactic that we use? You know, is a sign that maybe you're not you're not uh, put up, made up for the game, right? That you might be somebody that should be put in the back office and not listened to. And so I do think that there's a cultural element of it within politics. So I tried really hard, man. I, I when the publishers came to me, the first book that they pitched me was like. Write a, a a burn book. Did you ever watch Mean Girls? <laughs> yes. Mean Girls? Like write a burn book about Republican operatives, and I and I was like that was appealing, but I felt like I just couldn't do that in good faith, and and it wouldn't have felt as fulfilling as writing a book that like has some burn book elements, but also like looks back at my own uh, choices and culpability and and uh, and all that. Yeah, and do you think that? Um yeah, I mean, this is the idea that you know you're all on a team. I mean, I'm not in politics. Yeah, I just write, but a lot of people who are in politics are are my friends and people you know who are involved in activism. And I've heard this term a few times. Have you heard? Have you heard the term truth cuck? Truth cuck? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't know. Okay, well, maybe that. you. Well, okay, maybe you never. Okay, well, uh, not yeah, this is, enough, the, I'm not spending enough time on uh, on uh, what's it? What Truth Social or Parlor? I guess. <laughs> no, uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not on Truth Social. Just basically group chats. I'm not in these. Yeah, these. Like, weird tell me about media Truth Cuck. Well, I mean, you'll be like, okay, this argument is hurting Democrats. Oh, but actually, I looked it up, and it doesn't have much to it. What are you, a truth guy? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, you've sort of, I don't know. Yeah, that's... I'm, right, I'm a that's truth, a sign I'm you don't... That's just guy. another phrase. That's another way of what we would say in operative land, which is like, oh, you don't get it, right? Like, yeah. I, I, there was an example. This person didn't make it in the book. It didn't make the cut. Um, but uh, uh, they were working at the RNC, um, and, uh, you know, when Trump comes in. And... and you know, just they were always didn't love, you know, Trump style, you know, it wasn't for them, but like this was their career and they stuck around and, you know, for whatever reason they decided to stay. Um, and I was, uh, and, and then Trump gets in, Trump wins and, you know, he would do something and say, like Spicer would go out there and lie about the crowd or the Muslim ban thing would happen at the airports. And, and someone from the white house would call over to the RNC and say, Hey, you got to defend us. You got to put out this statement. You got to put out this tweet. And this person 
would say, said that, you know, early on, a couple of times I'd be like, ooh, I don't know if we should defend him on this one, or oh, I think, don't think we should phrase it that way. They're lying or they're exaggerating. And like for the first few, few times, people are like, oh, okay, thanks. That's good advice. Like we don't want to create unnecessary bad press for us. But then the next few times, it's like, wait a minute, you're a truth cuck. And then the next few times, it's like, wait a minute, you're a traitor, actually. And, you know, they get a call from the White House, which is like, are you on board here? Are you on the team? And so I, I just think that that is like the culture of how things develop, right? Which is you get a few tries that you can break with the team and say oh hey i don't i think this is an unstrategic or, or a bad idea but but if you're continually doing that then then you're seen as 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 not on board with the with the system yeah i think that's right and i think one insight you guys who didn't like trump from the start have had that a lot of us you know sort of didn't understand or learned late was that yeah this moral corrosiveness matters like so i look you know I, when i was back in 2015 2016 i'm like okay i hate the iraq war um you know there's some things about you know uh, republican establishment i don't like so this trump guy comes along like who cares you know he's doing he's, he's saying some things that that i like policy wise but the way you put it like yes there is just like a sort of a there is a sor- sort of moral uh debasement you know that goes on over time right so like the QAnon thing, I mean, for example, starts, you know, that's not part of the 2016 campaign, right? It it starts like in the fringes somewhere. And then like you have no guardrails at all. And like Michael Flynn is now pledging allegiance to it. I mean, you're like, wow, this is this is crazy. And, you know, the anti-vax stuff sort of worked like this, the election denial. And by 2020, I think it was just clear that like, okay, this wasn't just a policy disagreement. There was something very morally corrosive going on. Um, and it was leading to all this other bad stuff that, you know, that, that's ultimately, I think, self-defeating for the party. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, this is why you have to sort of be a truth cuck from the, from the beginning, because, you know, it, they, once you have the concept of truth cuck, I mean, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, but if this was true of Iraq. Right. I, honestly, so I wasn't around. People, a lot of the uh, MAGA types, you know, will say to me whenever I try to get on my horrible high, high horse, they're like, "Well, what about Guantanamo? What about Iraq?" And I was like, "I, I was smoking pot in, in the dorm room when that happened." Okay, like I hear fair, uh, fair enough, I guess. But like, I, I don't. Please don't lump me in there. Um, but, but you know, look at what happened to McClellan. For example, during the Bush time, right? Like this is so maybe Bush was corruptible in a different way, right? But it's the same thing. It's like when you get into this groupthink and this team ideology, it's like the team is doing something bad, but oh, you can't speak out against it, or else you become an outcast. Like like McClellan was treated as like enemy of the state number one mm-hmm. conservative yeah. media back then. Yeah. And and he can ended you, up being the who McClellan was? I mean, I'm, oh, yeah, I yeah, know, so Scott McClellan was, uh, was a uh, spokesman for the White House during the during the Bush years. And eventually, I, I don't I don't have the timeline in front of me. Like I said, I was a kid. Maybe my brain was a little cloudy at the time. But uh, so I don't know where where during the war it was. But but he eventually comes out and and kind of speaks out and ta- and writes a book and kind of talks about how you know um, he was made to, to uh, blur the truth about exactly what was happening in Iraq and about the motivations for it and and how he, what he thought was was happening was wrong. And he speak and, and he spoke out about it and like his view, especially he was an establishment Republican guy, ends up becoming basically the the g- generic Republican view. Fifteen years later, like during twenty sixteen, right after Trump wins, like that, it's hard to find a pro Iraq war Republican now, right? Um, which always gets my MSNBC friends frustrated when they're like, "I was watching Fox today," and they're like acting like it's it was our people that did the Iraq war, and they're like, "No, that was you. That was your network." So anyway, um, McClellan gets gets th- basically thrown out and, and gets really demonized in conservative media. And I bought into that demonization, actually, as a young person. That's why this was formative for me. Like, I remember being an entry-level person in politics and being like, oh, I don't want to be like that guy. Like, that guy's a bad, you know, he's not, you know, he's helping the other other side. And I look back now and I, I think, no, totally wrong. Like, McClellan had that right. So anyway, I, I think that that moral corruptibility is true beyond Trump. But for me... It was just so plainly obvious with Trump that, like, that, that eventually these lies, like if you have to always be defending somebody or always be saying, oh, you have to take him seriously, but not literally, you know, and always having to, to brush certain things aside, eventually the things that you brush aside are going to catch up to you. And like for Trump, it actually did, it took longer than I expected, frankly. Um, but, you know, it, it obviously does on the election, on the election denial stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, you say, um, so that's interesting that you go back, you go back to the Bush administration and you don't just see the Iraq war and the Guantanamo Bay as, as sort of policy f- 
failures. You sort of see the corruptibility sort of starting there. That's interesting. So do you think that like during the Bush administration, like the early uh, aughts, that the Republicans were worse on these matters, on these just, you know, not policy stuff, but basic integrity and honesty and not demonizing people than the Democrats were in that era? And if so, when, when does that start? Yeah, I think on the margins, and obviously the Clinton stuff, uh, you go back to the, the, Dem- the Cl- Democrats aren't perfect, right? I mean, I, if you think, if you look back at, at the way that the Clinton team acted, uh, you know, this stuff has, I think uh, uh, one of the things about getting older is that you you have a little bit more appreciation for the long, long arc of things, right? I mean, the, cl- the corruptibility, the Clinton behavior around the sexual assault accusations, you know, he survives that in 96 and does, and it doesn't really hurt the Democrats at all um, when it's happening. In fact, it probably helps the Democrats because a lot of the Republican attacks on him seemed like very overwrought and weird. Um, but even though the fundamental facts, had they stuck to that, were, were quite damning for Clinton, um, uh, particularly, you know, maybe not Monica, or, or even Monica, really, particularly some of the other accusations. But now fast forward to 2016, it's 20 years later. That, that that Hillary gets this used against her. And I think in a very effective way after Access Hollywood, as as whereas Trump is able to say, no, I everybody is corrupt. I'm not anything special, right? Like I'm not any di- I'm not any different. All of these guys just put a f- nicer face on it. I'm just an authentic version. And so I so you know, I think that at, at that level, both parties, you know, participated in things over the years where in order to benefit for short term gain to benefit the team, they corrupted themselves uh, in ways that, that hurt them in the long in the long term. So I, I don't know. I, I do think that the, the rep- that were some there is something unique, a little bit unique about which you get into in your recent article about the Republican media infrastructure that that from, you know, basically the late 90s on. You know, created a, uh, an incentive structure on the Republican side that was slightly more um, uh, susceptible to some of these, you know, some of these, you know, corrupt abilities that I talk about in the book that then end up it ends up becoming this monster that explodes in the in the digital area and 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 then in the Trump era. And I think that by the time we get to like twenty, I don't know, twenty twelve, let's say. I do think that there's a meaningful difference, and even 2016 especially, a meaningful difference between the types of people that work for de- that want to work for Democrats and the types of people that want to work for Republicans. And now, uh, this isn't to say that all Democrats are pure, or that Democrats don't lie, or any of that shit. Okay, like we can come up with plenty of examples of Democrats acting poorly, but I just mean that in, in aggregate, you know, the Obama, the West Wing era drew like a lot of earnest. Democrats who like really wanted to help the country and get in and they get it, you know, and then the Trump era and the social media era and the Fox News era attract a lot of Republican operatives who want to be, you know, ball busting, you know, you know, own the libs, trolls. And, and, and like those two, you know, kind of cultures start to diverge, I think, more in recent times. Um, I think that there's a natural corruptibility of all of politics, but I do think that there is an imbalance at this that 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 emerges particularly kind of in the late Bush era into, and then certainly in the Trump era, it gets put on a, put on a hyperspeed. Yeah. I think that that sounds yeah completely correct. I think that if there, you can do the both sides system, you know, until the, until the Trump era, until the Trump era, really, I mean, it really becomes hard there. And if you can't see it, you know, if you can't see it with January 6, I mean, you'll, you'll never see it. I mean, he just makes up, you know, the, you know, the election was stolen based on nothing. I mean, you, like you, you talk to people and they always have something, right? You talk to smart people. Um, I don't know if you have many friends who, who like Trump still, um, but they, uh, you know, they're always like, oh, well, the mail-in voting, some, you know, the, you know, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did X or Y on mail-in voting. Okay, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I, I've never really looked into this. Um, but that's not, that's not what's going on. That's not what he's The guy would have got up and say the election was stolen and a huge portion of the country would have believed him literally no matter what it could have been the most transparent election in human history that was just so completely obvious and you know they're not talking about that they're talking you know they're bringing on uh, uh this uh this crazy woman who's talking about you know venezuelans and the voting machines and and all this stuff and it's like it's like yeah you have to you know you have to see it at this point um or I the Black you know, Lives Matter thing, right? Which is like, you know, you can always yeah. do this both sides. Thing. Like you can always say, yeah. the, pro- like, the problem with the Black Lives Matter thing is like that, what, it was different, right? Sure, can you always find some liberal or somebody that votes for Democrats that does something bad somewhere in the world? Like, yeah, in Kenosha, yeah, but, but it wasn't. Joe Biden, they weren't waving Joe Biden flags in Kenosha, right? Like Joe Biden wasn't the impetus for it, right? Like the, the January 6th happened only because of Donald Trump. 
only, right? Had, had Mike Pence been the president or even another MAGA person who just isn't quite as deranged. And look at Mastriano, right? Mastriano, this is a great counterexample. Mastriano, to me, seems extremely deranged, was one of the leading Stop the Steal people in Pennsylvania. He loses the election. He concedes. Are there, are there, are there MAGA people storming the Capitol in Harrisburg afterwards? Like, no, no, there aren't. Like, the only reason that event happened was because of Donald Trump. He was the impetus for it. It was his lies and his, his corrosive behavior and his egomania like that's the only reason that that happens that's the only reason that that people died that day it's he's responsible for ashley babbitt's death and and the death of the the officers even if the even if it happened in a day or two later um like all of that happened just because of him like that is a fundamental category difference from like oh there, some liberals antifa rioted in portland somewhere and the politician that you hate the most didn't didn't uh, uh, criticize it as effusively as you wish they would have. Like, okay, I, I wish that the Democrats would have effusively criticized the Chaz zone a little bit more than they did. But like, that that's still very different. Those are two very different things. Yeah, I think you addressed it. I was going to say, let me sort of channel and, and steal, man, what my friends who bring up, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter in response to that. And they do bring up the Black Lives Matter in the January 6th, uh, you know, whatever you bring up January 6th. And it's, it's I mean, it's funny because it's like, like, okay, Kennedy was like assassinated, right, in, in 63. And it's like, why do we, like, we talk about a coup more than crime, like, right? I mean, we talk about Kennedy's assassination more than all the murders in the 1960s, obviously. I mean, we do that. So, it, like, it matters more, like, you know, the nature of the violence. But, yeah, let me let me try to channel them and see if I can, you know, say something sensible here. Um, it would be something like, look, civilization needs order our inner cities they look like garbage they have looked like it terribly since the 1960s since liberals um got control of them um since the war in court and their criminal po- and their uh pro-crime policies we've had black lives matter we've had a increase in uh the murder rate that's been uh historical bringing wiping out 20 30 years of progress in the last two years and you know biden doesn't tell people to to go out and riot but look, you, you know, if liberals want to be moral, they need to contem- condemn this and condemn this forcefully. I mean, during the George Floyd riots, dozens of people died. I think it was like 60 or something. I mean, and th- these are these are pogr- programs against immigrants. You know, some of them are programs against immigrants, you know, stores. I mean, can you imagine if the right was was doing this? And, I, you know, you can't, I, I guess there's no way to make this a direct, like, uh, a direct comparison to January 6th. These are obviously different things. Um, but, I think I know, I know. but my response is always like, who organized uh, the Jan- January 6th was organized by the president and was organized by members of Congress who are still there, who are getting put on committees right now to run oversight over the over the current administration. And it's not as if Gavin Newsom was out there saying, let's 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 break into the stores. I, I, I mean, did, did they handle it perfectly? No. Were there policy failures? Yeah. But like, but, but, but there's, is there a democratic backlash right now? That's like, oh, the people that broke into the stores that got punished, we need to get them out of prison. You know, like, 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 are there people who are pro rioting? I mean, sure. Could you find one liberal on the young Turks or maybe who did one segment on CNN one time in the afternoon who was kind of pro rioting? Sure. But are there democratic politicians? I don't, maybe Cori Bush, if I looked at her whole oeuvre, like, could you maybe find one? Uh, but like, m- many, much, most of the Republican conference in the House is either pro January 6th still or neutral. Like, like there's, there's like 20 people in the whole House conference that would come on this live stream with you and say, what happened was bad. It was our fault. And we need to do something differently. Like, you, you can't find somebody to do that. And that's a Republican right now. So I just, I, I, I think that that you're tr- they're trying to to conflate like two things that are not really the same as all at all. And I mean, we can have discussions about liberal failures around crime, sure, in the cities. Yeah, things have gotten worse. Things also did get better. You pointed out things got better for a couple decades while Democrats were still controlling the cities. So, so you know, obviously there's some other factors at large here, but also you know violence. You know, whenever I see this, I'm like gun violence and di- and violent crime is worse in the South. Than it is in New York City, than it is in New York, right? So, like, I mean, there's more concentration of people there, and there are more other petty crimes and violences. So, I'm not, this isn't to undervalue it, but like, there, there's fundamental cultural problems here that are at play too. It's not as if there aren't any Republican-run cities, but it's not as if Republican-run areas are like bereft of 
of crime concerns. Yeah. Well, I think they would, I mean, they would say, and maybe they, Wagga wouldn't say this, but I think some would say that's just, that's just demographics, basically. That's just the South demographics. And those are Democratic voters anyway, but like, it just shows either way that policy yeah. is not, <laughs> policy, <laughs> policy is not the determinant here. And I think, I think at least that is, uh, that is correct. Yeah, you're right. The distinction between, yeah, you're right. There is, I, you know, it, it's like, I guess maybe a better version of this would be like, okay. I care about the inner cities looking safer and maybe Republicans are marginally better on that. And maybe Republicans are marginally better on, you know, low taxes and regulations and, you know, things like that. So maybe I overlook that other stuff. I, I think the problem with this is you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what a five years plus of like magnification of the party is going to be just looking at like the last five years. So I, I think, yeah, I, I think that there, there needs to be some kind of, there needs to be some, there needs to be some like level. I think for me, what really was disturbing, and let me know if you have this reaction to it, was when they turned on, um, when I saw Trump, like, uh, <laughs> guys, are you okay? Just drop the mic. Yeah, no, microphone drop. All right. Okay. We can gif that for my, yeah, for my old, enemies. <laughs> old, old style. Yeah. Not, not, uh, not a mic drop, but just literal microphone drop. Just drop. a mic fall. <laughs> the uh the brian kemp thing i remember trump was once talking about brian kemp after the 2020 election and they start chanting like lock him up lock him up and i'm sitting there like wait a minute what did what did brian kemp do is he's like a MAGA guy like in every single way that you want except he didn't just come in and overturn the election and say i'm gonna give georgia to trump and i was just looking at that i'm like this is incredible this is a cult of personality that is not based on literally anything but what this man is saying now actually the thing is good just really well, quick, back, yeah. I think it's a good example of like where we do kind of know that the Republican Party is continuing going down kind of the darker part of MAGA direction just based on who's winning these primaries and, and what's happening in conservative media. I went to the Talking Points USA conference in, in, in December hearing what those what the people are saying on stage there. I mean, Brian Kemp is every argument that you could make for DeSantis, you can make for Brian Kemp and, and like probably better, right? Like, like Brian Kemp won a swing year state. He won it by more points. Right? If the point, if the argument for DeSantis is we get our MAGA policies with somebody who can win, right? Like that same argument could be made for Brian Kemp, but even more, right? Because it's a more important state that he won. Um, uh, you know, the state is doing very well. Like Georgia's, Georgia is, is is doing well. I mean, I think that even on a, if we're just going to kind of judge as a theater critic, I, I find Brian Kemp to be more charming than Ron DeSantis, who's kind of like weird and maybe might not wear well, right? So if this is a winning argument. So so there's not, the only thing that, that DeSantis is doing better than Kemp is, is one, he didn't speak out against Trump on January 6th or on the, during the Stop the Steal stuff. Um, he dabbled in it and then became quiet. And, and two, he's better at like playing the, uh, you know, kind of fake culture war games. Like I'm going to put up some bill that is going to end up getting overturned by the courts that like, you know, people talk about on Fox News. I'm going to send immigrants from Texas to Massachusetts. It has nothing to do with my state, you know, in order to get people riled up. That's what DeSantis is better than Kemp at. The, the performative MAGA culture war stuff and and that he he wouldn't oppose trump directly the way kemp did that's it like everything else and 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 yet and so now what how are they rewarded well desantis is their heir apparent kemp is boot right I mean, like and the, those are the only two differences i think i think that just kind of shows you where the energy is still yeah and and so about the cult of personality thing you know it's interesting because I, I thought it was just you know it was just personally trump but the the way they respond to him on the vaccine issue is very interesting because it's the first time I see any kind of real pushback to Trump. Like, you know, he can get up on these rallies and say anything. It seems like the one thing he can't do is actually defend his, you know, positive record on Operation Warp yeah. Speed. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you see that? Because it was surprising for me and I'm still trying to sort of incorporate it into how I yeah, understand Well, that. look, here's the thing. Trump was always mostly a bottom up phenomenon. Right. He uh, and and so he had the, a few issues that I think he was in line with the base on just kind of instinctually, instinctively, um, you know, that he'd been for a long time. You know, the Chinese and the Japanese are screwing us and, you know, we need uh, better trade deals. And like, you know, I'm a builder. Right. Like a couple of those issues. Um, yeah. Well, uh, immigra immigration was the big one, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. And but immigration a lot, I think, was part of the bottom up one. I don't think he like really passionately cared about that. I think he glommed that on to kind of an existing population. Oh, you don't you don't think he cared about immigration? I, I thought doesn't he have a you don't think he's like looking at the border and he's getting mad like everyone else? I mean, that doesn't seem legitimate for me. There's a story where Sam Nunberg and I don't you know, you can't trust any of these guys, so who the hell knows what's true and what's not true, but there's a story where Sam Nunberg and Roger Stone, when he first goes to CPAC, came up with the build the wall line as a way to get him to remember to talk about immigration. Because he likes talking about the other stuff more. America's getting screwed. We're embarrassed on the world stage. These guys, the swamp, these guys are cucks, right? Um, so anyway, I, I don't, I can't get inside Donald Trump's lizard brain. Maybe he did have a passion for immigration before, but po- point being, he had a few things that he was in line with the base on that he's passionate about. And then he was really good at, at him playing the audience and sensing what they were into, you know, when he was on the trail, like a good performer and his team you know, reading the tweets that were coming in, you know, and then I was back in the early days when he'd like quote tweet white genocide 69, you know, and quote tweet cat turd and all that. Like, so between the feedback from the tweets and the feedback from the live audiences, he kind of was able to cultivate this understanding of what people wanted. But, but really the Trumpism was, a, was a mostly a bottom up phenomenon that the voters were sick of the kind of the neocon, neoliberal, whatever you want to call it, free market stuff that that us and the establishment had been pushing on them, and, and that Trump was their vet vessel for expressing that. Um, and so, I, I now I think that so, and then I also think that there's a cult of personality element layered on top of that because he was a celebrity. Okay, so now the question is: We fast forward to 2024, and you know the beast is a little bit out of his control, right? Like all of those people that had all those issues. You know, he hasn't been out on the trail; he's been listening to them. You know, he felt like the the vaccine thing would be a. He didn't predict that the people were going to get upset about the vaccine thing. Operation Warp Speed seemed like actually a classic Trump thing. I'm going to build it. We're going to do it fast. We're going to do it the best, right? And you know, I don't actually have to do anything. I'm just going to tell the smart people over here to do it as fast as they can, and we're going to beat the chain, right? That seemed more naturally him, and, and that was misaligned from the, them. And I, and I think that now when you hear him, I think that's his biggest vulnerability going into 2024 is that he's not quite as in touch with their grievances as he was back back in, in, in 15 and 16. Yeah. Maybe he edits well, it. Yeah. But I, I mean, I wonder. He, the, the, I think he's had enough feedback no, now to know that. And he watches, you know, we, we know he watches TV and, and stuff. Right, a lot of TV <laughs> time. Too, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we, he, he probably has enough feedback to know that uh, he probably is not the best thing to be so, you know, pro-vaccine at this point. So it's interesting why he's not adjusting. Is he just uh, is he just stubborn? I mean, does he need more feedback? Does he need more rallies to, to get it? Or is he just as a personal you know, pride? What sort of, what's for, why doesn't he yeah, just I think his out? instinct he- to please is conflicting with his desire to always be right and perfect and that and have never everything be big and beautiful and wonderful and the best. Um, and so I, I think that, um, that that's really where, but, but he, cause he, he now caveats it like the vaccine stuff, you know, like he does something he'll, he'll do like a little wind up, which is like, now I know not everybody is there on this, but like, boy, did we, you know, go fat. And then he tries to turn it on the media. Like they didn't believe us. They said we couldn't do it. The media is out to get us and they lied. And we, you know, like that's how he kind of frames it now. So yeah. I don't know. Like it's, you know, another, uh, you know, another porter, it's another sort of model of Trump's. He might just be like, you know, he's just like a child. Like, so like yeah, right. some of the others, some of the other hints of this are like, you know, he, he had to be sort of, I, I think the base likes the bashing China stuff and you see it in conservative media. He sort of has to be dragged kicking and stream, streaming. He sort of genuinely wants to like Xi Jinping and right. same thing with Kim Jong-un. He's showing people a letter. I don't know what, portion of the electorate you know kim jong-un fans you know or, or you know what that what that appeals to so you know maybe is he just well i guess maybe that could be his own thing like he just they're leaders they're powerful he's a leader he's powerful they all yeah. should be friends but it is sort of like he does act against his own interests sometime and it's interesting to think of like you know when these cases are yeah thinking of him as a child is a is, a, is usually a nice rubric i think <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> I guess, yeah, a child can be both those things, right? A child can respond to feedback and a child can also, yeah, have his own little stubborn, you know, quirks. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So do you, um, well, let's put it this way. I mean, are there, what's, what do you think is the most like uh, uh, legitimate grievance that say the MAGA, the right wing populists have? I, so I think that the right wing populists have a lot of legitimate grievances. Um, I, I don't, what I don't think is that 
the politicians that they have put forth have really any interest in serving them, like, you know, beyond uh, rubbing their bellies about like their cultural grievances, right? Like, I, I think that there were, I think that there was a legitimate grievance about Iraq. I wrote this in the book about when I look back at the autopsy, I think that our biggest mistake, right, was that we had those of us who were there working on for people to remember the, the RNC autopsy after 2012, when we looked at why we keep losing, how we can do better. You know, we put forth a model that was like, okay, let's do better in the suburbs. Let's, you know, soften our edges on cultural issues. Let's appeal more to women. Um, you know, stop with the, you know, anti-gay stuff, which is obviously something that I appealed to, you know, be a little uh, softer on immigrants so that to try to do better with the, with voters of color. Right? Like that was it. And that model was colored by our own biases, right? Like, cause that's what we all yeah. wanted. Like we all were yeah. moderate neo liberal, whatever, you know, kind of, whatever you want, name you want to put on it, like like urban Republicans. Okay. I, I think that you, we could have, Trump put then out a, a different model that appealed to a different kind of voter, um, uh, you know, that was, okay, no, we shouldn't re-look at our opinions on immigration and on cultural issues. We should re-look at our positions on economics and foreign policy, right? Like, and, and, and I think that there there were some legitimate points there. Um, you know, I'm still pro free trade, and I think that on balance, free trade has lifted more boats than it has sunk. But it's sunk some, right? And and I understand those. I think are some legitimate grievances, and I think there should be things that that we that the government should be doing to to be more responsive to people in those communities who have been harmed. The Iraq War was a fucking disaster. It was a disaster. I, I don't think that. And now I'm still a glo- a globalist. Watch out, listeners. I don't think that like that means that we shouldn't be helping Ukraine and that there aren't other smart foreign policy engagements. I think there were some unique things about what was wrong about Iraq, but it was a disaster. And I think that those the people's grievances about it were legitimate. And so, um, you know, I, I I think that some of as we talked about a little bit, I think some of the crime and punishment stuff is a little bit overblown. Like to, I, I'm I'm much softer on gun. Like for example, I, I think that. Guns is as much as a problem as the policing um, issue, but okay, but we could all talk about that, right? So I, I think that there are some legitimate grievances that are had. My my thing is, who who is a, like say what you want about Josh Hawley? At least he's trying to put forth some ideas to address them. Everybody else is just a clown. I think if you look at the J, I think the J D Vance race is the best encapsulation of this. He starts as this like thoughtful writer who's like, how can we reimagine? immigration, trade, economic policy to be more responsive to working class voters. That's how he starts. Very thoughtful. He ends the campaign as like a, just a, a, a caricature that is talking about how Mr. Trump was right about 2020 and how he has questions about the vaccines and how about we should listen to all these voters complaints about cultural matters and how Ukraine should pound sand. We should care about our own border, not their border. Like, I, I, so I, I kind of start to wonder, can like populist conservatism that's serious that addresses real grievances actually actually work or will it necessarily turn into this kind of clownish Tucker Carlsonism? So, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, you seem to differentiate. You see when I when you go to legitimate grievances, you talk about the Iraq war and you talk about sort of these economic issues. Yeah. Um, you sort of um, you sort of uh, brushed aside some of DeSantis's uh, cultural stuff. Yeah, um, I don't think that's and, legitimate. Let's let's hash it out. Okay, so you don't think it's so legitimate? Like it can mean two things. It can mean like it's just stupid, or like it's not what people care about. Now, I, I think it is what people care about, right? You wouldn't yeah. disagree that they care about critical race theory and they care about gender. I would. No, I, I think that it's stupid. Yeah, and I don't. Okay. I, well, I, I think that it's. I'll add a third category. I think that it's stupid, and I don't think that it really is impacting their lives in any meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Have you? S- have you seen some of the data, you know, for example, showing that, um, uh, you know, among young girls, you know, you know, like a third consider themselves gay or bisexual or, or trans. Yeah. Like, do you, do, have you seen stuff like that? Because a lot of people I think do see that. I've, I've known a lot of people who have had kids in public schools and they're saying, look, you know, there was the, the, the debate over gay rights, you know, 20 years ago is not the debate over gay rights today. You know, they're teaching kids ge- just seem to be teaching kids about gender identity pretty early. I mean, they seem to be not neutral in the matter, but schools are ce- celebrating it. And people do have concerns about this. Is, is that not, is not, that about something yeah i I talked to dan savage actually the gay sex advice uh person about this at our at a bulwark event just uh, over the weekend um and and i i pressed him on this question right like the high rates of um 
identification of LGBTQ um, among among younger people. And so, I, you know, I, I think that, yeah, some parents are, are uncomfortable with that, right? Like, I, I received an email from a parent recently that was like, my child was lecturing me about dead naming somebody. And, and I don't, I just... I don't really appreciate that, and and I don't, you know, I feel like I'm being judged. And okay, so that's that is real in the sense that's a real feeling that that person is feeling. But like, isn't this also a tale as old as time? Like seventeen year olds, like gloms on to something to to separate themselves from their parents, and uh, you know, over time it comes down. I I mean, I, I think that there are a handful of outlier legitimate examples about actual surgeries and things that are happening am- among minors. That, that that worries me a little bit. Uh, but I think that this cultural question of, oh, these kids are like identifying, you know, as demisexual because they want to be alternative. Uh, like, is that, re- is that really any different than like when I was kids, like girls wearing black, black fingernail polish and calling themselves goth? I, I don't really think so, right? And, and I think that in some ways it's very positive, right? Like there are some kids, I don't, would have been nice for me to be able to be gay in high school, for example. I don't know, caused a lot of problems for me in my life going forward that I've overcome and have been fine, but I know a lot of people who didn't overcome them. Um, I think that there are a lot of kids that felt like lonely and isolated in col- in high school and growing up that no longer do. I think that there are a lot of kids with alternative families that feel much more comfortable being able to talk about them. And there's the thing, like in the the thing that bugged me about the DeSantis bill and the gay stuff. Like I've got a kid who's five, and so when you give a vague instruction, like a vague law that's like, oh, you can't give instruction at kindergarten about gender and sexuality. Like, what does that what does that actually mean for my kid, really? So if you're instructor to do a family tree, is that illegal now? Some people in Florida and that supported that bill would say no. Some people would say yes. The one of the people that sponsored co-sponsored the bill was quoted as saying, "Oh, I, I don't want the uh, teachers in second grade giving out." Uh, he might have said, "I don't know what grade he said," but some early grade giving out an assignment that's like Sally and and Sally has two moms and and <laughs> Joe has two dads and like how many dads? You know what I mean? Like a word problem that has a, a, a gay family in there. Like that's crazy. Like that's insane to me that you would want to have a law to ban that. So I, I just, I mean, I think that there are, you know, there maybe are some narrow, legitimate it concerns about, you know, underage transitioning things that are permanent. But like this idea that we need the big government to come in and and set Common Core curricula for like whether schools can have rainbow flags in their classroom, like seems fucking preposterous to me, and and not and not like something that is actually harming anyone and, and, yeah. and frankly is net helping a lot of kids that, that yeah. went through a lot of shit in the past that they shouldn't have had to yeah i think I, I think i'm more you know i think i'm more sympathetic to the DeSantis thing i agree it's not the most important thing in the world i mean I, I think a lot of it is just old people freaking out about what young people are doing like things have always been but yeah i mean i mean i'm a little more sympathetic but let me ask you about the uh, the race stuff so a lot of that stuff i mean the critical race theory you know it, it's just the way i look at it is people don't like being disrespected, right? So if you had somebody, you know, if you had somebody who said like, who went out and was a politician and just who like insulted black people, just like openly insulted them, used racial slurs or whatever, they would have, like, you could, you could go to black people and say, look, he has good policies that'll help you, right? It doesn't affect your lives. Who cares? I don't think anyone would say that's like a sensible thing to say to black people. I would say, I think most people would say, okay, you have a sort of right just to be upset and not want to be disrespected in that way. I look at a lot of the critical race theory and like a lot of sort of the rhetoric about whiteness, white this, white that. I mean, I know to you, like probably like a college educated person, like you you get it, like, you know, whites are not, you know, the poorest, most oppressed people um, in America. But maybe if your life isn't that great and you see these people with college degrees and these people with positions of power, you know, using white male as an insult, I, I could I could sympathize with how people would be insulted by that. Do, do you see that as something that people, you know, are potentially right to get mad about? I mean, are de- okay again this is some, this is like this little well, it's not it's not Bi- it's not biden it, it's it, i mean yeah, but it's, it's this little like, trick that 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 that, yeah. that uh, maga people like to play right which is like i'm mad about something that a professor at swarthmore said or that like an msnbc weekend host said and that uh, like that's not really the same as like what 
actual Republican candidates are saying, right? Like, so it's a different thing. So anyway, so that's just one of my picadillos. I, I don't, I, I don't know what the government role is here. I, I, I think that the government, like, like I, I don't think it's, you know, I think local school boards, as is always the conservative view, <laughs> like should be determining these things. Like the idea that Ron DeSantis would want to like, you know, have his, like whatever chief anti woke czar determine what the AP can can put. Well, in the, well, they, they are they are pushing for they are DeSantis is trying was uh, inter, uh, involving himself in student board races. So you're okay with that as long as it's it's, it's about the local level. It's not the the statewide law. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I again. Would it be my priority if I was the governor of Florida and I was trying to fix the schools? Probably not. But but if you know, DeSantis wants to like make uh, you know particular arguments, or there's specific school districts that aren't doing well, or if there's some kind of you know kids that are being left behind because I. But I again, who is the harmed class here? That's what I'm trying to understand. So like, it's the white kid that has to learn more black history. Is the harmed class here? Like they're feeling they're feeling offended. Like who is that? what? What are we? I, I just don't understand like what what the grievance is that we're trying to help. Like I understand that some white people's feelings are hurt because some black people are saying white people are bad. Okay, I, I get that. Like lots of black people's feelings get hurt all the time. Um. So okay. So everybody's feelings are hurt about somebody somewhere saying something mean about them sometime. Okay. Now there's some examples I think of schools doing weird things that I think that maybe there should be oversight on. Like, I don't love it. I think there's a Michigan school, for example. I saw this story where, like, they were having race-segregated meetings so that the black kids could feel more comfortable. I, 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 don't, I don't, you know, I don't think that's great. I don't think we should head back down a path towards, towards race segregation. I, I mean, I think that there were things that my social studies teachers taught that I thought was too liberal. And, and there are things that some people's English teachers and religion teachers are teaching that I think is too conservative all over the country. Right. So like that is a th- something that's happening. I don't, I don't know what the president is supposed to do about that. So, so like, that's really where, what, what, like what I don't, I, what I don't, I don't understand what the, what, what, what the harm is that's being remedied that requires the federal government to, to, to make sure that white people's feelings are not hurt quite as much. I mean, when you, well, I mean, for example, when you hear that, like, you know, all white people, you know, so we, we've determined in our society racist is, you know, one of the worst things you could be called. And then you hear white people, white people are racist, white people are advantaged. Not all people feel that they're racist or that they're being advantaged. Again, I think if you, if you apply this standard to other races, right, you, I think people would find it a lot more understandable that people would just, Biden. And you're right, and you, you can say it's not Biden. Biden doesn't talk about white privilege and this and that. We're, we're the, you know, we're just talking about the grievances. We're not talking about whether the solutions are right. And I think you're right that the, a lot of the mega world is not providing much or uh, much in the way of solutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, people feelings get hurt. I mean, people fight wars over you know I have my religion and language, and you know you insult me, and you know I have my own, and I'm going to fight you. I mean, people care about these things, and. It seems like low hanging fruit. I mean, I think for the left to do a little more sister soldier stuff on this stuff, I think that could potentially be beneficial for for everybody. I don't. I don't disagree with that. And I, I think that there are certain situations where there are lefty people out there that are that are staying and doing crazy things, um, and and staying and doing things that are unnecessarily alienating the people. I'm not for alienating people, um, but you know what I and 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 look, and I, I also understand just just people's casual discomfort with with big changes particularly in schools you know they don't they they got a good education they want you know their kids to get the same education like i under i understand that but like in the grand scheme of things i think that most of what the politicians are doing on this is performative bullshit and that like on balance you know, we, we need to be able to, that there also is like a balance that needs to be struck that, that the Republicans don't seem very interested in, which is that, yeah, like additional, per, you know, learnings and, and reading people from additional cultures is good. Hearing about your own history, hearing about people like you in history and in, um, and in the news and in, in, in writing is, is good. Um, you know, having a school where everybody feels safe and comfortable, no matter what their family structure is and what the rate is, is good. So, like some of these changes are good, and um, and 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 some in some places maybe they're taking it to to 
to a place that I, I think is might not be that is not perfect or harmful or a mistake or stupid. We have a gazillion school districts all around the country. We could have a cons of TikTok feed. I'm confident that shows teachers saying stupid shit um, about climate change and about gays and stuff. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think we also just need to have a little bit of perspective on on that on that side of things. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to the MAGA people on this stuff than you. But on the on the immigration and trade stuff, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm probably less sympathetic than you. Like, could somebody take your because you seem to you still I mean, you still believe immigration and trade are are net goods, right? You're still. Oh, no, I I, I am. I I just I'm what I'm saying is I'm sympathetic to their that they've had an economic that there's been an economic hardship. Uh, I I actually don't think uh, on, on immigration. I, I mean, I, I think we should be we should have significantly more immigration right now. In particular, I find it hilarious. Like the immigration restrictionists are all like, "Oh, we need to lower. We need to we need to decrease immigration so that we can increase wages." And now, like wages are are skyrocketing for people, and we have in, and we have inflation. And like you go back to the immigrant and you go back to the immigration restrictions. They're like, "So can we bring in more people now to you know help deal with that?" And they're like, "No." Yeah, now we have a different yeah. reason why we need to keep immigration. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, the, yeah, they, they they hop around one reason to other. But I wonder why you you could say the same. So your your view on the the social what's to be taught in schools is like, okay, you have a grievance, but like it's largely irrational, and you know, suck it up, snowflake. <laughs> and then on immigration and trade, like, okay, you don't like these immigrants here, and you seem to realize that a lot of this stuff is just ad hoc, you know, post hoc. Oh, I don't like him, so I'm going to say it's about wages or whatever. Why not just say, you know, suck it up? These are these are this is just basically based on cultural yeah, resentment. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was maybe not clear in my earlier uh, uh, comments. Uh, so to be clear, when it comes to immigration, uh, yeah, your concerns are BS, and you should suck it up, snowflake. I, I do have that view. <laughs> uh, the trade trade is a different animal, okay, because Free trade in aggregate has helped us. I'm I support free trade. I think we should have done more free trade deals. But like there are in narrow, there are people that have suffered real harms, and I think that's maybe also true about immigration in border in some border towns and like there's certain places, right? So I don't really think this is true about you know the dad who's unhappy that like the kid got had to do a homework assignment about transgender people like i don't think that's a real harm like i think that there are like, that's the differentiator that i'm trying to make cuz i do think there are certain people that have suffered real harm and i think that like at least having a an, a discussion that's like oh we should revamp our deals the way we've traded china i, I think that like Again, Trump didn't actually do any of this, but like Trump had some points about like how China was screwing us over on various things. I think some people suffered real harm. People that had the jo- had jobs had been shipped overseas. People that has commu- communities were centered around a particular uh, factory, you know, that that got shut down. Um, you know, and I think there's the Kevin Williamson argument here, which is like move to where the jobs are. There are plenty of jobs. Suck it up. But I, I just think that's like a big ask for people, and so. Um, I, I like, I'm just, I, I think that uh, particularly when you combine it with the Iraq war, look at Ohio, for example, if you live in like the Mahoning Valley in Ohio and like the plant got shut down and half the kids in your high school went to Iraq and they came back and every, they got PTSD problems and, th- and there's a lot of opioids in your area and there are fewer jobs. Like that's real. Like they, they're, they're suffering real harms, not suck it up snowflake harm. So even though I, I, I think we should still have more trade deals, I think that a politician that said, okay, we need to balance that out with figuring out how to help these communities that are suffering. That's legit. Yeah. So it sounds like this, this sounds like basically compassionate conservative conservatism. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm a compassionate conservative yeah. still. Yeah. I've had, I've changed my views on a few things. I'm a gun grabber now and I don't really give a fuck about the top tax bracket anymore, but besides that, I'm still, a, I'm still basically a compassionate conservative. Yeah. So, so how do you think about, uh, okay. So like, Hmm. I guess so, so. Is there? I mean, is there anything? You know, maybe we disagree about politics, but you know, I want a sane Republican Party. I want one that doesn't, you know, play footsie with anti vaxxers I want one that just, you know, wins or loses elections and then and then moves on. Ex- yeah. You know, accepts them. Um, what is like? You know, do you have hope something could be done here? Is there? You know, what is there? Is the party ha- is what it is? I mean, is there? Because this is not. You know, Trump might have made things worse, but this clearly didn't start with Trump. Um, what can people do? Oof. Well, Trump could die. That would help. <laughs> he could, yeah. Um, he will eventually. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there'll be that. Because um, I think that there's some unique externalities that he causes, right? I think that there's some fundamental underlying problems, which we've discussed, in the conservative media, in just, you know, people's um, 
you know, the, the, the reactionary nature of what some what folks are looking for in the party right now, bottom up. But Trump, like also, again, I, I don't it's really hard to imagine people waving Ted Cruz or Ron DeSantis flags and storming a Capitol. It's like it's like you, you kind of have to be a psychopath, you know, like a, like a legit psychopath in order to keep up a lie to that level of degree. And, and, and so I think that having somebody at the top of the party that's like less of a psychopath would at least marginally help. Um, OK, now, after that. I, I don't think that there's much hope for coming back to compassionate conservatism anytime soon. I, I think that my hope for the party, which isn't really a party that I think I would belong to again, um, but is that that might have some politicians that I could tolerate and in certain situations might might support, um, would be something that that tax back on um, on on some uh, looks more like a Boris Johnson party in Europe, right? Like a labor, you know, like a, a Tory party, right? That, that maybe, uh, uh, tax against some of the, like the free market fundamentalism on certain things. Um, you know, that, that does, that does continue to be culturally conservative, but that like tries to orient around more real, <laughs> real life cultural concerns. Um, you know, that has, that has maybe a more modest foreign policy goals, but is not nationalist. I don't know, you know, Brian Kemp, right? Like, like, could we get back to a Kemp place? Like once the Trump Kemp cult of personality thing is passed? Possibly, possibly. But I, I don't, I'm not that optimistic because if you just look at where we are today, Trump was gone after 2020 and the House Republican conference is, is more MAGA and crazier and has like more anti-vax insurrectionist lunatics than it did when Trump started, right? So like the party's still kind of moving the wrong direction, even though Trump's Trump's not on the stage per se. Um, and I guess he's running again, but but since he wasn't, you know, um, in office. So I don't, I, I think that like the best way to fix it is is to try to fix the inputs that are creating this, which is a lot of, a lot of what's happening in the conservative media. And I don't really have any hope that that's going to change at all. Hmm. So at the beginning, you know, you say back, looking back at 2016, you didn't think that uh, uh, there probably maybe was nothing anyone could have done. I guess one thing I'm wondering, and I was listening to Ezra Klein's podcast the other day, and he, and he brought this idea up on something that I wonder about. Why does the establishment seem so, you know, seems like, I want to say passive, like, okay, so Paul Ryan, you know, I don't, I don't see him anymore. I don't know what he's doing. I think he could, he could be on Fox every, you know, every so often if he, if he wanted to. Sure. Um, John Boehner, I, I don't know what he's doing now. Um, George W. Bush, you know, disappeared. Um, it doesn't seem like these people who are from the previous generation are the people who were sort of chased out of the party. Eric Cantor, you know, where, where's he? I, I have no idea. Um, why, why do they seem so so passive in the in the, in the sort of in the face of this onslaught? Yeah, part of it Even is no one's not uh, not an office anymore. Yeah, part of it is personal. I don't fuck. I don't. I don't want to deal with the madness anymore. This is why I retired. Right. Part of it is just, I just think reality, which is like that, 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 well, and part of it is that they don't want to get asked about Trump and all this stuff and have to, and have to always be calculating, like, where should I be on this? Um, you know, and then I think that if you become it from a position of, oh, I'm going to fight Trump day in, day out, you end up in my space, right? Where like you, you're kind of a, like a dem for all practical purposes, right? Cause there isn't anything within the party. Look, we tried to recruit. I didn't think anybody was going to win, but we tried really hard to recruit a Trump primary in 2020 for the purpose of what you're talking about. I wanted there to be a vessel and a, a leader, a figurehead who was like, hey, I'm probably going to lose this primary. He might be me 80 to 20, but I want people out there to know that there is a 20 percent and we can build from this in the future and fight from within the party. We couldn't recruit anybody to do it. Like Joe Walsh ends up doing it. God love him. Um, but, you know, that wasn't a real thing, right? Like, that. you know, we needed something a little bit more legit than that, like a, a figure that had a little bit more potential to be seen as a future kind of leader. Um, and a, a lot of folks said no, because they didn't want to take that. They, they didn't want to, you know, do a hopeless effort. They didn't want to take Trump's heat. And, and, and so I think that what has happened is that the old establishment of the party is basically fractured between people that have accommodated it and come to terms with it. A lot of the characters in my book, people that are fighting it, but are now for all practical purposes in league with the Dems, and the Biden world, and, and and then people who have just 
said, screw it, I'm going to go paint in Midland and like check out. Right. And so, you know, a group that was already like basically a minority within the party in 2016, right? Trump wins, you know, the establishment candidates get about 40, Trump gets about 45, uh, you know, 15 for whatever you can divide it up between Ben Carson and, and decide which side those people should be on. But so it was a group that was only about half the party anyway. A bunch of them have checked out already. So now it's even smaller. There, it just doesn't feel like there's a lot of power from which to fight from. Yeah. And so the personality thing, I mean, you can't make someone, you know, personality, you know, different than, than what they are. If Paul Ryan doesn't want to, you know, sling insults with Donald Trump, you know, nothing's going to, nothing's going to make, he just wants to you know, show you that uh, the tables with the Medicare and social security mm-hmm. is going to go up and <laughs> that's a different kind of guy. Yeah. I mean, is this sort of like a tragedy of politics? You know, I have an article, I have a essay I wrote, um, you know, why is everything liberal about the idea of why liberals culturally dominate institutions? And it just, they care more. I mean, as a, as a general matter, is it sort of like this within the Republican Party? It's like people who just are sort of inclined to be establishment Republican types with like Berkeley and instincts and just like markets and don't want the government to, you know, solve all the problems in the world, but just sort of be kept in its place. You know, do they just not have the stomach as much as the MAGAs people do who think the 5G, you know, network is like shooting messages into their brain? Is, is this just the tragedy here? Well, I get maybe part of it, but that group dominated for a long time. I, I think that, I think that, there are two things that have happened. The, the the media environment has just eroded their power. And 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 now we're in a world where where the Burkean types, um, their skill set, you know, their ingrained skill set is not actually as important anymore, right? Like what were they what were they, they were good at? They were working the inside game, you know, um, being responsible, like handling the the, you know, uh, uh managing organizations, right? Uh, the people now that are that are empowered are people that are good at trolling, performative assholery, being able to go on Fox, being able to say things that that get that get big fundraising dollars, right? So, the, so the incentives have changed in part because of campaign finance changes, part because of the way that media has worked. You know, I think just you know, I always said that Jeb, um, that George H. W. Bush, that Jeb was more like his dad, and W. was more like his mom. And so I think that W would have been able to survive in this environment because he still was good at that kind of stuff, the performative side of it, even though, you know, he has politics, you know, the manner in which he did it was a little different than the current, you know, nihilist trolls, but like he still would have been good. Jeb wasn't, he was more like his dad. His dad never would have survived in the modern day Republican party, right? Like he was able to survive because it was a different world. There are three networks you can manage his weaknesses, right? Uh, you know, and um, he was good at playing the inside game. Um, and so that's just, we're in a different world now. That's part of it. And I think part of that different world is both our political structures, but also global. Like, you know, you just can't overstate, you know, we get very, and my book is just so navel gazy because it's the point of the book is to be navel gazy. But like what's happening here is basically happening everywhere. Right. And so like, there's something to that, like that says that there's some broader, you know, tectonic plates that are happening. That's kind of creating this, this this power dynamic where sort of on conservative and on the right side, it's more the populist types that are, that are emerging. Yeah. I think that that's interesting. George W. Bush, you know, would have, would have been able to handle Trump. It's sort of like one of those things like, Oh, who would win a fight? Like Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali. You're trying to right. imagine these figures. Are different. In 2016, if Bush could run again, I think that, uh, you know, the immigration of the Iraq war had hurt him. So he wouldn't have won there, but right, right, just right. transported. Oh, we're in a hypothetical guy. world here. We're in a, yeah. we're in, we're in alternative universe C, but W has never been the president. Trump and W are running. I'm just saying he would have, uh, maybe Trump would have still won. Right. But I think Trump would have been able to, was it been much better suited, or excuse me, W would have been much better suited for that circusy debate environment and like how to, you know, kind of manage, you know, from a personality standpoint we didn't have anybody that was good at that christie was the only one that really had that ability and he and he wasn't willing to take on trump mm-hmm. yeah do you think uh, so you, bridge gate yeah and yeah that's interesting so well, why yeah why, why would yeah i guess I, I, I was he was he going for vice president is that what christie was doing in 2016 i think it was a great ministry it's one of my favorite counterfactuals because like christie just gutted marco and it was kind of like, why? I don't, you know, I could, I <laughs> I'm sure, and then maybe he's the last person there. But like, had he used that energy to try to gut Trump? I don't. Might not have worked again. I, I, I think Trump was for all these other reasons we've been discussing was was probably not beatable. But but Christie never tried, and um, 
And I, and I think that maybe he thought that he was going to do it later and then he never took off. And so, uh, or maybe that he's like Cartman and he's a big bully that, that can't actually throw a punch when he's worried he's going to get a punch thrown back at him. I, I don't, uh, you know, um, uh, if you ever get Chris Christie on the podcast, that's, that's what you should ask him. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The, um, yeah, the, that's, yeah, that's interesting, but that's, I mean, that sounds sort of, I agree with you. The technology thing is probably a big one. I think there's something's interesting about our, uh, about our um, political system that you know people don't think about. Like I think in the UK, like you don't have these rural districts. They just have a party list, don't they? Like uh, yeah. with us, you know, we have like you know, you know, this county in the middle of nowhere that's not connected to anything is going to have a congresswoman, right? They're yeah. going to have Mar- they're going to be able to elect Marjorie Taylor Greene. You can't really do that, I think, in the UK. Um, you're right. There's a lot going on, but that sounds sort of you know, it sounds sort of hopeless. I mean, the technology is not going to we're not going to get rid of the internet. It's probably going to get more decentralized, um, if anything. Um, so oh, yeah, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty helpful. I'm sorry. Did, were you expecting yeah. me to be offering hope here? <laughs> I was expecting you to get, tell the youth how they could, how could they could take their party back? And bring us uh, back no, to no, no, no. The uh, last, my editor said that, that, that usually these types of books have a final chapter. It's like, okay, so I've laid out all these things that are problems. Like here are some things I think we could do differently going forward. And, uh, maybe that's a preamble to a future book. And, uh, when he told me that I was like, yeah, this uh, this book isn't going to have one of those chapters. We're gonna we're gonna end end in end <laughs> darkness. Um, I I just don't see it. I, I like I said, I think that we can get things back to kind of a normal, you know, relatively more normal populisty place that still has. Look look at what's happening with DeSantis in Florida. I don't like him. Okay, I just I don't I don't like the fucking refugee thing. I think it's inhumane. I don't like the Stop Woke Act. I don't like Don't Say Gay or whatever he's calling it. Like I, I don't. But like all of that stuff. It's like kind of just for show, like right. And there are a couple of people that are being hurt, but like it's mostly for show, you know. And and then he's got like this other secret DeSantis that's like running in background, that's like calling Jeb and asking him for advice on how to run uh, run the operations and making sure hurricanes like happen, right? Like there's this competent like kind of DeSantis operation that nobody in the national media ever sees, right? So. You know, I, I, that's like my most biggest green shoot is like if maybe like I'm not going to go back to that party. But if the Republicans can get to there, then that's good. The problem is the thing that I worry about with that is that as time goes by, it gets harder and harder to think about the people that would staff that kind of administration and, and have a lot of confidence in them. Right. Like the types of people that have been drawn to the this is how you get a George Santos. Right. The types of people that are getting drawn to the Republican Party are different types. There's a supply and demand element to this. You know, Bill Crystal at the board, he's the type of guy that always gets a call. That's like, I just graduated from Harvard HBS and, you know, I was a Marine and now I'm thinking about moving home to Kansas city to run for Congress. What do you think, Bill? Like, like, you know, he's, he gets those calls. And 10 years ago, those calls are from people who are like, I want to run as a Republican. You know, can you put me in touch with some people? I'm, I, I'd be a good office holder. Now those people are calling him and being like, I can't be a Republican. I can't do this with, I can't answer questions about all this stuff. Like I'm not really a Democrat. Like, should I run for a Democrat? Should I not run? Should I just go take a job for Google instead? Right. Like, and so there is just a million of those conversations are happening all at the same time. And there's the inverse people are like the people who are like, hell yeah, I love owning the libs, you know, like, like they're, they're now opting in. And so that, that's like, you know, when I think about how, you know, c- could you successfully like put together a Frankenstein model of, of all of these groups in a way that's like not that harmful, that's the, that, that, that part about it worries me. Yeah. Well, I mean, the people who will be attracted to Santos are not going to be the same, you know, people. So you will be marginally better than the people who are attracted to a sure. Trump administration, you know, the people who are still with Trump. For sure. Oh my God. I, and the, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of, that's not just the role of DeSantis here. I think people are sort of, you know, people who are sort of in conservative media, maybe at a, at a little bit of a lower level. I mean, I think they have a role to play here and say, look, let me give you the best argument for, you know, the Republicans as to why we need entitlement reform or why, you know, we could do some wise things on this, on these school issues and things that go, sure. go too far. Um, so that seems, that seems solvable. I, I think if you, I mean, the way you actually, you, you did actually seem like, I think you do actually, you could actually, I mean, it's not impossible for me to see once, once Trump is gone. Do you, um, so, so it seems like from what you say, like DeSantis is the, is the stop Trump candidate right now. Would you think it's a bad thing for say somebody like Larry Hogan, Mike Pence, should these guys just drop out and, and everybody who would work for them and just support DeSantis? Well, no, not yet. 
Um, I, I think maybe. Like, I think that that's a question for um, the winter. Next winter, we're still in winter. Um, I, I get annoyed by the pro DeSantis stands who try to use that never Trump argument against them to be like, you guys need to, everybody gets got to get on board with our guy now. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, let's, can we just, can we just watch him on the stage for a second and make sure he can do this before, before I have to sign a blood oath to like supporting somebody that I don't really like. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, we don't, there's a lot of things we don't know about DeSantis because he hasn't, as a governor, he hasn't had to weigh in, right? Like he's, he ducked around the vaccine thing. I mean, if anything, he's been kind of anti-vax, right? Ukraine, like he hasn't had to talk about Ukraine. Would he support Ukraine funding? Would he help the Ukrainians? Um, you know, any of the other of the, you know, kind of tra- crazy Trump controversies that get brought up. He hasn't had to like really pick a side. He gets to cho- pick and choose his spots and he'll weigh in, you know, on the gas stove thing with a meme, but like on other things that were where the where it's not quite as clear where he'd go, we don't know where he is. So I I just I think that he's the most likely one for sure. Um I think that Larry Hogan is not gonna run for president. If he does, he's only gonna get one percent. So I don't know that it really matters whether or not he does. Um and I think that if you look at these other guys, I think that there's a reason. There, it's I I think that there is a reasonable argument to say, hey, I'm going to get in. I don't want Trump to be president uh, or nominee again. I think that you know for whatever you know all the obvious reasons. Um, but let's see how things go. We're going to get on the debate stage and kind of see you know if DeSantis is up for it. And if we get to New Year's and you know it's it's Trump 48, DeSantis 44, and me at six. And I'm being a spoiler, then I'll get out, right? I, I I think that's a reasonable thing to do. You saw that in the Democratic primary last time. You know, I wrote a big article, you know, for, from my 2016 experience, it, or like right before South Carolina, that said, "Hey, Democrats, you have like two weeks to get your shit together, right? So if you're Pete or Amy, like you got to drop out now because otherwise it becomes too late, you know, you know, because of all what we were discussing at the beginning of this podcast. So I, I think that there becomes a time when it's like you got to shit or get off the pot, but like that isn't now, and I don't think that people should feel bullied by DeSantis when, I, when you know, I think that it's more likely than not that he's the alternative, but like it's certainly a non-zero chance that he totally face plants and he doesn't wear well at all. And Sensible, yeah. Let me, uh, let me, um, let me close with some, uh, I'm just nothing about sensible, Richard. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> you are sensible, you are sensible, Tim. I, I've been impressed with you. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so are you, um, for, for the pressure of the book, I get the impression that you're not, are you, are you friends with any Trump supporter still? I get the impression that you, you're, you're not. Am I remembering that correctly? It's been pretty tough. Um, uh, yeah, I have, I've quite, quite, I guess if you, what you, I guess it depends on what you mean by Trump supporters, but I, I am still, I am still friends with people that voted for Donald Trump and that are in Republican politics. Um, a handful. I've lost a lot of friends that fit that bill and I don't really have any friends who are like, I wear a MAGA hat. Uh, with the exception <laughs> of the character in the last last chapter, is it mostly is it mostly uh, they like don't like you, or is it more that like you just can't see how they could they could put up with this guy uh, as far as the most uh, a most little bit of both? Yeah. A lot of them have dropped me. You know, a lot, there's a lot of mutual kind of like you just don't text each other anymore, right? It's like what do you have to say? You know, you're gonna say I don't. I try to be. That's about people in Washington, by the way. Like I, I try very hard in my life to not judge or drop people you know like i've got aunts and uncles i've got childhood friends right who who voted for trump and you know we'll talk about politics sometimes or we'll just talk about our life and and so i I don't drop people or judge them based on that even though i i find i find trump deeply immoral um as as evidenced by the book but but people that are working in the in the game still helping him um, they see that I judge them. I judge them very publicly often. And so that tr- creates pretty big strains on our relationship. So very, very few have survived that. Yeah. Okay. So Tib, you're a, um, you're still a young guy. What's, uh, what, what's next for you? What are you doing now? And wh- what's next? What do you think I should do? Uh, I think you are, I think you have talent. I mean, you've talked about these people who are sort of establishment Republicans who are not good on social media or not good at sort of promoting themselves. I think you're very good at it. Um, you know, I don't see you much on Twitter. I would, I would advise you to, are you, do you tweet a lot? I tweet. Okay. Okay. But maybe, maybe we're not, the algorithm is not putting us in the same circles, but yeah, I would, if you're, if you're not, if you're not tweeting a lot, I would, I would recommend tweeting more. I think there, I think you have something to say. Um, and I think there, I think that, um, 
you know, if you're going to reform the party, I think it's worth thinking clearly about, um, you know, these cultural grievances and how we can sort of steel man them to the greatest extent because they're not going to go away. I mean, it's not going to be like you're going to say tariffs on Chinese, you know, cars or whatever. Yeah. And, I don't know if China imports cars and like they're going to love you. It's going to have to be something that like maybe you're, you might be too hard on DeSantis because it's going to have to be something like this, right? And um, well, I don't know if you've seen my stuff on civil rights law, but I think that a lot of the civil rights civil rights law does lead to downstream effects of this stuff like disparate impact and uh, restrictions on free speech and stuff. So, you know, I would I would stay in the public you know profile. I don't know what else you know what, what other opportunities you have out there. But if I was going to be in politics, I'd stay in I'd stay in the public debate. I'd I'd use my talents to get on social media. You're. Um, I would, and I would uh, do outreach with MAGA and sort of MAGA adjacent people, and see if there can't be some kind of synthesis. I think one thing's gonna, one thing about um, that we could, uh, when we talked about um, th- uh, ways to sort of change the party, you know, one thing that could humble it potentially, and you're seeing a little bit of this, is uh, electoral loss, right? You know, Trump, the shine came off Trump a lot yeah. um, in twenty uh, in this last midterm. Um, that keeps going for a little bit. I mean, the Democrats, you know, the Democrats win the presidency for like a decade. You know, people will be looking for something. Owning the lit, you can't own the libs permanently if the libs are just, you know, crushing you. you know, every time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, so there'll I be an appetite. That. I, I hear you. And, um, and we did, I did Republican voters against Trump in 2020. Um, I hope I don't have to do that again in 2024, um, but we'll see. And uh, I'm going to keep writing. I've been, really enjoyed the pivot to writing in life. I, like there's been something soul cleansing about not being an operative, uh, because you know, as I said, like even even the purest of hearted operatives, right? Like at some point you're an operative, right? Like uh, questions come up that you you have to like consider, you know, um, all the different factors. And I like that I don't have to do that anymore, and I can just sort of write and um, and 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 observe. I don't know if I want to do that the rest of my life. Uh, but I think this is a good time to do it. I've been enjoying it. And I, and I hope to have, I, I appreciate you having me on. I hope to have more of these conversations. It's been like crazy to me that it was just like even old friends, even people I used to pitch at Fox and, you know, uh, uh, you know I, I, don't, I guess I don't want to call anybody out by name, but you can think about who the big conservative podcasters are. And I've been like, let's come on, let's hash it out. Let's like do this. And they just, they just don't want to. Um, and so um, I'd like to do more of that if, if folks are willing, if you're if you're listening and willing, I'll I'll come do it. We can we can, we can spar it out a little. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was reading this morning. This is going to seem completely out of left field. Yeah, okay. um, but but um, Ron Unz wrote an article about the um, uh, about anti-vax. Are you familiar with Ron Unz's work? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, well, he's 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 believed some far out things. I mean, he has that website, the Unz, Unz Review. You probably yeah, I've seen it. I've seen that website, but I don't. I like I have a well, I have like a mental image of it being weird, but I I can't like. I can't place it, exactly anything. It's ever. weird. Although uh, Ron, 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 Ron had some, you know, mainstream, he had some successful ballot initiatives here in California back in the, back in the day. So he's, he's done some serious stuff in the past. Um, but he wrote a thing like taking apart anti-vaxxers. Um, and, you know, Ron Unz, like is known as something of a conspiracy theorist and he believes in some really, really weird stuff. But he looked at the vaccine dead. He said, all oh, your diet suddenly stuff is nonsense. He did, he did this thing. He had these beautiful graphs. And I was just reading this this morning. And he was saying, like, um, in the article that, like, all these anti-vaxxers were, like, writing subsects like, oh, um, you know, I didn't think of it that way. They trusted him because they knew he was a conspiracy theorist. Right. He was sort of a crazy person. And Ron, you know, Ron, if you're listening to this, it's uh, in the most neutral way possible, I'm saying this. <laughs> but the fact that he was looking at this data and saying, okay, maybe they're not telling us everything about 9-11, but look, people are not dropping dead from the vaccine. Right. <laughs> but people, people bought into that. So, you know, I'm not saying that, like, uh, uh, adopt every conspiracy theory out there so you can have more credibility with the mega world. <laughs> But, but, you know, like, I think like my world is like, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm known for being very anti-woke and I've written a lot about this stuff. And I, when I say these things about like vaccine or election or whatever, it has a little bit more credibility. There's room sort of, I guess there's room between, you know, being with the establishment or being with the mega. And I think finding that middle, I think could bring us somewhere better. Don't, don't disagree with that. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tim. Hey, Richard, so much. Thanks for having it. This was really fun. (laughs) 